Welcome to Hope is Here. My name is Greg Horn, and we're continuing our conversation with uh, Dr. Melinda Moore. She is a assistant professor of psychology at Eastern Kentucky University. is also the clinical division director of the American Association of Suicidology. She also has a private counseling practice here in Central Kentucky. Um, unfortunately, on top of the academic credential she has in this topic of suicide, she also has had a personal losses. Her husband, uh, 20 years ago, uh, ended his life, and so, uh, man, if you missed yesterday's program, there was a plethora of information that just talking about this topic that, uh, unfortunately, is this too many people's lives have ended prematurely. So go to our website, hopeishere.today. That's hopeishere.today, and uh, you can catch that. And uh, today, uh, Dr. Moore, I want to I want to talk uh, just recently. You and a uh, uh, another st- uh, Dr. Sorrell. Um, wrote an article talking about in the Herald Leader they asked and the title of the article in the Lexington newspaper just recently January 24th said Kentucky can do more to prevent suicides but it will take resources and a plan and it it started because of the death of a 12 year old girl here in Lexington and Wimber Middle School and we talk about adults a lot in the last program but man it's alarming how many children are taking their own lives isn't it yeah it's really problematic because these are young children they're between the ages of 10 and 14 and i think uh this this op-ed was uh, spurred on by some comments that you know the county coroner uh made about the problem that we have now have in Fayette county among young young people very young children taking their lives um i think it was stunning to him and to others public health officials uh that we had uh, over uh, five individuals in Fayette County this last year. So that is, it's reportable after you have five, then it's reportable. And so in Kentucky, we also have um, a violent death reporting system. So we also will be able to know more information around these deaths. So we'll have some idea about what contributed. But still, there's so much that we need to know and that we need to be doing in this realm. And uh, the op-ed that Dr. Sarrell and I uh, wrote together just really says, you know, school Schools, it's not just schools, it's communities coming together, it's the state, it's the county coming together. The state legislator, frank, uh, frankly, needs to really put resources, if we're going to do anything about this problem of suicide, we need um, a system where, you know, in the school you've got school counselors, you've got school psychologists, uh, they can identify and then, you know, contact the parent and say, you know, we've got a problem here with your child, they're having thoughts of suicide or they're cutting or we feel that they might possibly be at risk. Um, but then it's typically in Kentucky, it's up to the parent to then get that child help. Oftentimes with children, it's really hard for parents to even imagine that their child would be having thoughts of suicide. It's unimaginable to them. And so as a result, sometimes they don't do anything. And unfortunately, some of these circumstances then occur. Um, and so we need to have a better system in place where we have you know, uh, places the school can refer these families to, such as a community mental health agency, or like, for instance, in Columbus, Ohio, Nationwide Children's Hospital has a beautiful system set up in Ohio where uh, schools can refer children to the hospital, to clinicians, to get help, suicide-focused treatment help. So they take these threats and these these risks very seriously, and then they, they lead them to resources locally. And so that's really the kind of system we need to have in place. And also they do a lot of educating in the school system. And it's a really economical way of educating everybody in the school system and then also providing these resources. So I think this is what we need to be doing in Kentucky. Well, and one of the things that I believe you addressed in the article was that you said, you know, yes, they do address it with teachers, but it's kind of like maybe, you know, a 30-minute, maybe an hour thing or whatever. And, man, with this alarming increase, there, there really needs to be more of a focus, doesn't it? I mean, just one hour of yeah. training, and, you know, at the beginning of the school year really is not adequate, is it? It's not at all. No, not at all. Um, sc- teach, and, and unfortunately, there's no policing of it. So, you know, schools can pick whatever training. They have some mandates around trainings in schools here in Kentucky, and so they have to take a certain, you know, uh, I think it's an hour or two every other year, something like that. Um, and the, unfortunately, the training may or may not be a sound training. The information may not be helpful to them, and it certainly doesn't help teachers or administrators know what to do in these situations. And it certainly doesn't equip the school to refer children to you know professionals that can really help them. And so while it's a well-intentioned, these are well-intentioned ideas, I think we just need to do more and devote more resources if we're going to save these kids in the future. Well, what can, uh, you know, there's parents listening, and not just here in central Kentucky, but all across the United States on the podcast of our 
live radio program what is it that parents can do to kind of you know be more react you know, proactive instead mm-hmm. of having to be reactive what are some things they can do to help with these their children before they get to this spot you know where they want to end their lives yeah i mean you know this is the problem a lot of parents are doing all the right things and the kids are still engaging in you know self-harm behavior risky behavior i think having candid conversations with kids that are age appropriate about suicide is really important uh, letting their child know. I mean, parents, they find it, again, almost unimaginable that their child would be having suicidal thoughts. However, kids are getting inundated with it on television, you know, Netflix series, 13 Reasons. It's all over TV. It's in the news. It's now in their school, so they're hearing about it. And people somehow think that kids just have amnesia or are deaf to this stuff, and they're not. They hear it, and they absorb it. They take it in, and then they oftentimes you know, see it as perhaps a way of solving their own problems. And I think parents must be, you know, engage, not just engaged in their child's life and having dinner and all those things that, you know, the public health and the, you know, the, the, the medical community tell uh, parents to do. But I think really having conversations with them about suicide, what it means, the kind of impact, if you were ever suicidal, I would want to know. And then when, let's say, you know, God forbid something happens at school and the school contacts you, taking that very seriously and getting them to the best possible care in their community so you know whether you're adult or with children it really just starts with conversations because i mean it's so easy now in our culture just to text and families isolate themselves Mm -hmm. don't eat dinner together kids spend a lot of time in their rooms but maybe just having that heartfelt conversation with your child to say hey are you okay or what's you know anything hurting you or bothering you just Mm -hmm. maybe on a consistent basis they may not answer the first four days you do that but maybe the fifth day they do answer so is that maybe an appropriate way to keep that open dialogue going with your children yeah i mean i i think it's a balance too i mean i think a lot of parents get you know kind of over they overreact when their child is engaged in self-harm behavior and then they take everything away from them they isolate them they're, they don't give them any privacy or space. So I think it's a balance. I think having these conversations with, without being alarmist, without, you know, being, you know, sort of having a sense of urgency, just having ongoing conversations about what's going on in their child's life and making sure that if their child seems like something's different, something's wrong, something's bothering them, they definitely query and they find out. But do it in a loving way, not in a kind of alarmist, kind of beating down their door kind of way, you know. Well, and, you know, we know we see people nationally, things happen, Kate Spade, uh, Anthony Bourdain, but unfortunately right here at home uh, in that article that you wrote recently, co-wrote in the Lexington Herald Leader on January 24th, 770 Kentuckians died of suicide last year. So, I mean, that's a that's a problem here at home, isn't it? Yeah, and, and this is a, a real problem. Kentucky has historically been in the top 20 states with the highest suicide rates. And, you know, it's not unlike other rural uh, states with, um, you know, usually the highest states with the highest rates are typically out west. So, like, you know, the Nevadas, you know, Montanas, all of those states. But Kentucky is rural. It's got a, a population that owns a lot of guns. It's a hunting culture. It's very much part of the culture to own a gun, which is, you know, well, guns are wonderful. This is not about guns, but it's a highly irreversible means of killing yourself, too. Um, And also, we have few resources. So that combination, you know, and particularly also with the stigma around suicide, not wanting to talk, feeling if you talk about it, you're going to put ideas in people's heads. And that's absolutely not true. Um, kids who are thinking about suicide, actually talking about it, can help them kind of manage and deal with their suicidality. So I encourage parents to talk with them about it directly, particularly if there's been a suicide in their school or in the community. Finding out what they think, what they know, how they feel about that, how they feel impacted by that is really important. You're not going to put that idea in your kid's head by talking about it. Well, one of the things that you shared on yesterday's program about after you experienced it with the loss of your husband by taking his life you talked about you know the guilt that you feel and i unfortunately have friends that have had to experience that through their son or a friend a co-worker or a spouse uh, how did how are you able to process and get healing f- from that guilt i mean i i think for me it was not through therapy because unfortunately none of my doctors my therapist my family and my family were full of you know, mental health people. I mean, they were people who, you know, might otherwise be able to talk with me about almost anything, but they didn't know how to talk to me about suicide. So with me, it was just a matter of kind of hanging on, 
Uh, but also, I will have to tell you, the most healing thing I did during this period was uh, was praying with Christ on the cross, mm. kneeling. I was I'm a Catholic. I'm a I call new Catholic. It's not really new anymore, but you know I was at the time a new Catholic. So going to mass, crying. Um, kneeling before Christ, taking the Eucharist, which is a symbol of hope, um, and so just participating in 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 my faith practice. Again, priests didn't know what to say to me. My family didn't know what to say to me. My therapist, my friends. Uh, so I didn't really have that kind of support. But what I did have was my faith. And I think through time, I ended up finding other people just like me. When I got involved in suicide prevention, there were lots of suicide survivors or suicide bereaved who had the same exact experience as I did. And I think there was a comfort in knowing other people who had gone through that same experience. Well, that's the thing. You know, I think the greatest lie that uh, the enemy tells us is that you're the only one struggling with this, mm -hmm. whatever it is. You know, it's depression or suicide thoughts or uh, shame from divorce, you know, job loss, you get fired. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. But, you know, I love how you share that part of it was just it's okay to grieve. And I think in our culture, we move on so much quickly to the next thing that uh, man our hearts especially when you lose somebody to suicide you, you can't heal in a hurry from that can you no you can't it's almost like having your arm ripped off without any anesthesia or any pain afterwards and people expect you three months later to play ball you know yeah. <laughs> kind of that analogy yeah. you're not equipped you, you can't uh, and you're in enormous pain and you're in enormous pain for a really long time i mean it's something that sticks with you for your life um but Suicide bereaved people have questions and yearn and have to go down rabbit holes and are in enormous pain for oftentimes years after their loss. Um, but I will tell you, I and another part of my research, I do suicide prevention research, but I also do something called post-traumatic growth research. And what I know is that you can go th these, through these traumatic experiences. And suicide loss is an unrecognized trauma. We don't recognize it as a trauma. You know, people who have been in, you know, combat or people who have been in horrible natural disasters or who have been raped or who have had other horrible things happen to them, you know, we not acknowledge those as traumas, but we don't acknowledge suicide exposure and impact and bereavement as a trauma and so um, what we know is that people who have gone through this trauma the, the potential for uh, growth within the context of this pain is also there as well what would you say to somebody that's listening and they're like they've got a friend you know a loved one that has lost somebody to suicide and they just don't know what to say you know they care and they want to but you know they just feel uncomfortable feel awkward what's what's the best simple thing that Somebody could say to somebody, is it to address it or not address it? Or what's mm -hmm. the best way to help somebody that you know has lost somebody that way? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like treating it like any other loss. I am so sorry for your loss. I know how, how much so-and-so meant to you. I am so sorry. Just know that I'm here for you if you need to talk. I won't make you talk. Um, but just know that I want to be of help to you. If there's anything I can do for you, make you a meal, you know, come over. You want to come over to my house, you know, let me know what, how I can help you in this situation. I think also just being a listening ear, letting people talk, not not talking. You know, we got two ears for a reason. One mouth, two ears, right? That's the old saying. <laughs> yes. And I think just listening to people who are going through this, because believe me, uh, in their lives, they don't have a whole lot of people that want to listen to their journey. Well, and that's the thing. I you know if you're you just heard what she dr moore said um you don't have to have the answers you know you don't have to be a therapist just to listen to acknowledge it and uh, let that person go from there it would just mean the world to somebody that's having to deal with the loss of a loved one by suicide if you're listening you're like i need to talk to someone right now i will remind you 1-800-273-TALK that's 1-800-273-TALK or 1-800-273-8255 or if you'd like to text there's a crisis text line where somebody is waiting to communicate with you right now 741-741 that's 741-741 you can text and there's somebody there 24 hours a day seven days a week to help you during this time of crisis and get you help my name is greg horn tomorrow we're going to continue our conversation with dr melinda moore we're going to talk about the faith aspect about faith and how we can help people dealing with the topic of suicide i'm greg horn and this is hope is here taking care of central kentucky's floral needs for over 25 years creations by karen features floral arrangements for every occasion from anniversaries corsages valentine's day as well as birthday gifts you can count on Creations by Karen to deliver beautiful anniversary flowers, new baby gifts, bridal arrangements, or sympathy flowers. Contact them today at Creations with a K. 
byKaren.net. That's creations-by-karen.net.